Uh, to start today's event, I would now like to welcome to the podium the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, the Honourable Curtis Pitt. Please join me in welcoming Mr Speaker. Thank you very much, Janet, and uh, welcome all of you to Queensland Parliament House, particularly welcome to the former Legislative Council. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the land of Aboriginal people and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, I thank uh, them as their first uh, custodians of this land uh, over countless generations. I also want to very briefly not repeat the acknowledgements, but certainly acknowledge Her Excellency, uh, the Honourable Jeanette Young, uh, 27th Governor of Queensland. And of course, I also wish to note there are numbers of uh, members of parliament here today and former members uh, to the clerk. All guests, uh, thank you very much for your attendance for this uh, very important day. Uh, as Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, I welcome you all here. And today really is a, an extraordinarily historical uh, seminar. The abolition of the Legislative Council 100 years ago has shaped Queensland's distinct political culture. Today's seminar will examine life, death and absence of Queensland's upper house. It's fitting that we commemorate this ceremony uh, at the Legislative Council Chamber itself, which opened for business in 1868, as did the entire George Street wing of Parliament House. Some of you may be aware uh, that in his original design for this building, colonial, um, colonial architect Charles Tiffin had proposed a sculptured sheep's head should be placed above the Speaker's chair in the Legislative Assembly, down the corridor. Tiffin uh, did claim that this was in recognition of the colony's main primary industry. But just before Parliament met for the first time uh, in this new building in 1868, Tiffin was ordered to remove the sheep's head, as it would ridicule the then speaker as a mutton head. <laughs> I've been called worse. This was the last minute change and I'm eternally grateful for it. While Tiffin uh, apparently insisted there was no hidden meaning in such a harmless creature, it was removed from the wall by order of the Executive Council, no less. But back to today's proceedings. One word always comes to mind when I think about the abolition of the Legislative Council. Class. By no means am I suggesting there was a lack of class in the Chamber, but rather I'm referring to the battle between Labor and Capital. The centenary mark today was part of a very significant year in Queensland history. In 1922, not only was the Legislative Council abolished, but Queensland also abolished the death penalty. First jurisdiction of the British Empire to abolish capital punishment for all crimes. So, 1922 was a year of great reform in Queensland. Today's seminar will examine some of its causes and its consequences. Uh, guests, uh, one and all, welcome to Queensland Parliament House. Well, the abolition of the upper house, what can I say? It's complicated. And that's why we brought together today five very knowledgeable speakers to help us better understand this very important political milestone in more detail. And our first speaker today is Lynn Armstrong. Lynn leads the Parliamentary Library's Information Management Services team, and she's had a long-standing interest in Queensland political history, and in fact has a master's research degree in the establishment of the Legislative Council. Her address this morning is about setting the scene for the abolition and she'll cover the period from the 1840s to the 1860s. So would you please join me in welcoming Lynn Armstrong. Mr Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, from its inception on the 9th of December 1859, Queensland witnessed remarkable and unique events of global significance. It was the first British colony given responsible government at its inception. It witnessed the world's first Labor government in 1899, as well as the first general strike in 1912. It saw its upper house abolished in 1922 and followed later that year with the abolition of capital punishment. Now this may give an impression that Queensland was a democratic chartist paradise from its, from its uh, foundation. Nothing could be further from the reality of a violent settler society begun in 1840, dominated by wealthy, ambitious members of the British aristocracy, acquiring vast tracts of Indigenous land and decimating their custodians. This oligarchy was accompanied by a signed and ticket of leave convicts. These sages of the British ruling class with exclusive political, social, family influence 
successfully dominated the proceedings of the Legislative Council right until its 1922 termination. With the arrival of liberal and radical-minded Protestant Scots and English tradespeople in 1849, intent upon permanent economic, social and political advancement, their view of a democratic meritocracy clashed with the pastless vision of a plantation society, with lords ruling over vast domains serviced by cheap, servile labour. If the Queensland Legislative Assembly assumed a flexible, if fraught, ability to accommodate evolving, laissez-faire, liberal, reformist, socialist ideologies, the Council consistently sidelined those few progressives amongst its members to retain its dominant ultra-conservatism. This inability to evolve and adapt contained the origins of its demise. Though colonists may have rejoiced when they learned that they would be granted responsible government in 1859, this seemingly progressive measure contained numerous hazards. Queensland had been granted this sovereign responsibility with few experienced potential leaders. A combination of direct lobbying by prominent pastoralists in London at the highest level of British government, their strategic use of class and kin, and the Imperial Government's desire to avoid conflict with the New South Wales Legislative Council laid a fraught foundation for effective governance. In the end, it was by the stroke of a pen with letters patent and an ordering council that the new colony was born. The lack of gestation at the local level witnessed the creation of an upper house where councillors had not learned the art of compromise and negotiation. As the decades progressed, they generally remained impervious. Their appointment for life turned the most conservative councillors into rigid reactionaries. Now, after that very broad and dramatic sweep of early Queensland political history, co-author Professor Kay Saunders and I will examine the intriguing story of pre-separation Queensland that led to a problematic upper house model in 1860 that was to satisfy very few. Two years before the official proclamation to admit settlers into the northern districts of New South Wales, well-connected pastoralists were moving their flocks into what became the Darling Downs. In 1840, Patrick and George Leslie brought their extensive flocks of sheep into Gurugubi, the ancestral lands of the Gidharpal people, many of whom they and their armed convict servants slaughtered after raids on sheep in 1844. In September, Patrick returned to Sydney where he married Catherine MacArthur, linking him closely to the powerful MacArthur family and the highest orders of the colonial elite, widely labelled Pure Merinos. His brother George then conveniently married another MacArthur daughter, Emmeline, in 1847. Their own lineage was distinguished as the sons of William Leslie, the ninth Laird of Warthill in Scotland. Neighbouring Eaton Vale Station was established further north in September 1840 by English gentry brothers-in-law Arthur Hodgson, whose daughter later married Viscount Lifford, and Gilbert Elliot, the son of a Scottish baronet, later the first Queensland Speaker, with family connections that served the British Empire as Governor-General of Canada and another of Vissery of India. Another early pastoralist, Ernest Dalrymple at Goombara, was the son of a Scottish baronet, while the Gore family, proprietors of Biandilla, were descendants of the sixth baronet of Manor Gore in Donegal Island. George Fairholme possessed even more distinguished lineage with his connection to the Duke of Athol. These were not the Bunyip aristocracy of New South Wales, but authentic British gentry and aristocrats with ancient and revered lineages. Now, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, Morris French uses the term mole-skilled gentry. For the emerging um, oligarchy, this is an apt description as these well-educated gentlemen were forced to become labourers, bullet drivers and general roustabouts alongside their assigned convicts and ticket-of-leave servants. Ruthless and determined, success meant a return to their status at home or lavish homes such as Jimbor, which rivaled the Queensland Houses of Parliament. Not only were the pastors engaged in acquiring land from the Indigenous peoples by any means, including mass poisonings occurred in Kilcoy Station in 1842, the constant issue of the shortage of labour hampered their expanding operations. But Imperial convict transportation policy was under review and influenced by anti-transportation advocates like Reverend Dr John Dunlaw Lang. Transportation to New South Wales was to cease after July 1840. Now, this might appear as a severe blow to northern pastoral expansion, but other imperial policies offered opportunities. 
In May 1839, Colonial Secretary Lord Russell suggested that New South Wales could be divided into three districts. Despite opposition from emancipists and the emerging radical anti-transportation movement, an 1840 Imperial Act allowed for the provision of new colonies. Conscious of the repercussions of the, of the Canadian Rebellion in 1837, Imperial governments also sought to mollify the competing financial and political interests emerging in New South Wales and moves towards responsible government accelerated. An 1842 Imperial Act provided for the election of 24 New South Wales legislative councillors within a high property franchise alongside 12 appointed members. Provision was made for the creation of new colonies above 26 degrees south. Now, the tiny northern district's European population hardly featured in deliberations. Their few New South Wales representatives were non-resident Conservatives, born before penal settlement, one even before Cook had even landed. The huge distance and neglect from the Sydney seat of government was to prove a continual lament. For northern pastoralists, their persistent issue was the endemic lack of labour. Free labour was increasingly expensive and few were attracted to those dangerous frontiers a shepherd could command up to £40 per annum. The New South Wales legislature attempted to renew modified transportation despite Governor Fitzroy's scepticism and widespread public opposition. Chips in imperial policy in 1846 by Colonial Sec Secretary Earl Grey saw the announcement of a North Australia at Port Curtis. A, colony, a convict colony with ticket of leave felons from Van Diemen land and parolees from London prisons. The pastors welcomed this policy initiative, but the experiment failed miserably. Experiments to import Chinese, Indian, German and even Argentinian gauchos in the northern districts also proved expensive and troublesome. Salvation for the northern squatters appeared in another imperial experiment when five vessels of so-called exiles from London Pentonville Prison, accompanied by their families, arrived in Moreton Bay in 1848-49. This effectively meant that there were more European people of convict origin in the northern districts in 1849 than at the height of the secondary detention penal settlement in 1830, 1831. However, the vision to populate these far-flung colonial outposts with free settlers was gaining political momentum, especially through advocates such as Dr Lang with his campaign for a northern district's cotton industry, small farmers, after visiting in 1845. His first immigrant vessel, the Fortitude, arrived in January 1849. Among those complement lay future progressive leaders with an alternative view to the plantation society of the pastoralists. They included men such as Robert Cribb, an ardent childless, Dr Henry Challender and William Pettigrew. A second vessel, the Chasley, closely followed with later notables such as Benjamin Cribb, Dr William Hobbs, Samuel and George Grimes. Five months later, the Lima disembarked in Moreton Bay, having crossed paths with a ship carrying the Pentonville prison exiles to Sydney. The passengers on these two ships, vessels, symbolised the two competing and incompatible visions for the future of the Northern Districts. Lang's 600 neo-Calvinist worthies, dubbed the League of Solemn Engagement, now formed the backbone of the Queensland Progressive Liberals. But the question of exiles was not resolved by the 1849 arrival of these educated Free Britons. Imperial thinking was that the Australian colonies should be given more latitude in dis deciding their own futures and constitutions, resulting in the Australian Constitutions Act No. 2. Growing pressure developed in the Moreton Bay District for the provision of a new colony at 30 degrees, now Coffs Harbour. And increasingly, wealthy northern pastoralists saw the need to directly lobby the imperial authorities. Notable Warwick pastoralists sent a petition in January 1850 to Lord Grey, requesting the certainty of large annual contingents of exiles. This coincided with huge, boisterous public meetings between pastoralists and urban liberals in Ipswich. Undeterred, a deputation consisting of leading pastoralists, Hodgson and Fairholm, along with Walter Leslie and Mackenzie lobbied Earl Grey in April 1850 for more exiles. In July 1850, influential pastoralists led by Patrick Leslie met in Drayton on the Darling Downs to plan a concerted separation campaign. The aristocratic Honourable Louis Hope now the proprietary of Kilcoy Station, along with five other wealthy pastors, were elected to form the Darling Downs Committee. Now with their own mouthpiece, the Moreton Bay Free Press, 
the oligarchy pushed forward their agenda locally. However, this call to arms also inspired the urban liberals to organise more strategically, now adapting the political slogan, separation and representation, which meant the establishment post-separation Queens on Queensland with both elected and appointed members. So public debate dramatically shifted from a simple demand for separation to the nature of future government. The past was countered with the establishment of the Moreton Bay and Northern District Separation Association, with a wider commu committee, including the influential New England landholder and lobbyist, Matthew Marsh. They sent their first formal petition to London as a result of this meeting. Southern gold discoveries and the prospect of even less free labour drove several hundred northern pastoralists to gather at the Brisbane Courthouse, May 1851, where Louis Hope and Colin Mackenzie were elected to lobby Earl Grey in person. Descended from Scottish earls on both sides of his family, with immense wealth coming through his mother's family slave plantations in Jamaica, Hope had the aristocratic connections to lobby the highest level of the London decision makers. But Earl Grey's successor to John Packington was not supportive of separation with convict labour. With the outbreak of the Crimean War in October 1853, the issue of separation in distant New South Wales was hardly a priority. However, London-based Matthew Marsh's political lobbying continued in private at the Oxford and Cambridge Club. Nevertheless, Governor Denison in October 1855 still urged caution against premature separation with so few white settlers and many of the wealthy having no permanent attachment. Then in June 1856, a high-powered House of Lords Select Committee probed the vexed question of transportation again. Their first witness, mover and shaker Matthew Marsh, unexpectedly argued that transportation was no longer an option in the Northern Districts. Though previously the strongest advocate, he mysteriously revealed that the pastoral lobby had entered into an agreement with town Liberals. He did, however, as did the next witness, Arthur Hodgson, forcibly promote the notion that transportation might be possible in the future in Cape York. Within days, Colonial Secretary Labouchere agreed to ascend to separation, suggesting a deal had been struck. But what would the new colony's responsible government look like? Notions of unicameralism, bicameralism, nominism and single mixed chambers, with both elected and nominated, were fiercely debated in mid-19th century colonial politics. Some upper houses, like that of Cape of Good Hope and Tasmania, were relatively democratic, with elected councillors with five-year terms. Others, as in Canada, involved nominations by the governor for life. The small northern district's European population entered into these same debates with equal gusto and division. As early as August 1850, the by now Liberal Morton Bay Courier dramatically derided the notion of a nominated councillor squatters as the Gomorrah of the Southern Seas. Debates about the future of transportation and the composition of, of an upper house were interlinked. Throughout 1851, as the anti-transportation forces centred around the urban libs, gathered strength, calls were made to oppose any notion of nominism. Ipswich solicitor, later Premier, and legislative councillor Arthur McAllister, merchant Frederick Forbes and Dr Chaloner led the cause. Now, London-based colonial office civil servants held both, both, held both political sway and continuity. Former Oxford academic and from 1848, permanent undersecretary for the colonies, Herman Merivale, heavily influenced by his friend Matthew Marsh, was far more pro-nominism, while his assistant, Thomas Elliott, looked more favourably upon Governors Fitzroy and Denison's belief that separation, especially with the life-appointed nominator, Upper House, was unwise. By the end of 1856, the Northern Districts had the unique opportunity to observe the inauguration of responsible government in New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia. All possessed Upper Houses with some provision for a partial or fully elected membership. The urban Liberals now rarely wavered from their commitment to an elected legislative council. The pastorists lobbying in London stood firmly behind their preference for a single chamber that they could dominate. However, the, their petitions received little support from Governor Denison or from Colonial Secretary Labouchere, who affirmed that the intended new colony would follow the president of the New South Wales bicameral model with the power to lay to make amendments. Thus, the probability of the creation of a unicameral system 
in the proposed colony was now becoming remote, even impossible. In January 1858, Denison set forth his proposals for the new colony, including a 12-member nominated council. Six months later, Denison changed his mind, proposing that the new Legislative Council should be entirely elected like the model that he had nurtured in Tasmania in 1855. At the same time, the tireless Matthew Marsh, now a House of Commons MP, continued to personally lobby the latest colonial secretary and still more petitions from leading pastors were delivered to Lord Bulwell Lytton. Lord Lytton rejected the possibility of immediate legislation to validate this position. His successor, the Earl of Carnarvon, reiterated that legislation would not be forthcoming, rather an order in council would ensue. When leading pastoralists made a last ditch effort to the colonial office to establish an antiquated unicameral system on the 28th of June, 1859, they were too late. Queen Victoria had signed the letters patent three weeks before. So unlike other British colonies, Queensland was granted responsible government by an order in council. The Queen was authorised by letters patent to allow separation, therefore forming new colonies. The new colony, named in her honour, had a parliamentary model imposed upon it in 1859. But instead of using the more democratic 1858 New South Wales electoral franchise provisions, the original draft 1855 order in council, possibly th um, uh, um, the, or the original draft of the 1855 order in council provisions with restricted franchise were applied, possibly through a clerical blunder. Thus, the new colony lost full male voting rights and inherited an unpopular nominated upper house. Now, Justice Patrick Kane aptly designates this arrangement as the establishment of cavaliers and roundheads, though in this instance, the rule of the Cavaliers was never reinstated after its 1922 demolition. And that's just the beginning. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Yes, just the beginning. Well, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Demeter Beanland AM. As I said, he is the president of the Royal Historical Society of Queensland, who is our co-host today. In a former life, Denver was formerly an alderman and vice mayor at the Brisbane City Council and indeed a member of the Queensland Parliament from 1986 to 2001. Today, he's a distinguished historian and is the chair of the National Archives of Australia's Advisory Council. His address is titled Who's Who in the Chamber and it's going to cover the period from 1860 to 1910. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Denver Beanland. Mr Speaker, members, former members, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of 1860, the population of Queensland was some 23,500. New South Wales, 327,000. Victoria, 521,000. Furthermore, only a small number of Queenslanders, that's Queensland's population, had the ability to read and write. That's where they were educated. And of course, we've had the situation where many of those that were educated were not really interested in going to the upper house because there was no real power in the upper house. The power resided in the lower house, the legislative assembly. And that's what's all important in this whole discussion. Qualified candidates were difficult to come by. During the first two decades from 1860, it was difficult to attract and retain suitable nominees to the upper house, the Legislative Council. Those that were really worthy of appointment wanted, as I say, go to the lower house. Now, between 1860 and 1922, 195 male members, male members, ladies, were appointed to the Legislative Council without payment. Only the president, the uh, chairman of committees and the uh, minister representing the government with a portfolio in the upper house were paid a salary. Until it was abolished in 1922, the Legislative Council was remarkably resilient and tough 
It's a very tough institution with an ability to, in presence, its conservative identity, while profoundly or paradoxically making concessions to the liberals, uh, the progressive forces in the colony. Nevertheless, its character was established at its inception as the pastoralists realise that conservative domination of the upper house, remember that conservative dom domination of the upper house could help ensure their economic and cultural transparency. Therefore, the pastoralists sought majority of politically aligned appointments in the upper house by governments of the day. This paper is about the leaders who were appointed between 1860 and 1910. The power to appoint members to the Legislative Council in the first instance was vested in the Governor of New South Wales, Sir William Denison, who gave Sir George Bowen the compliment. Bowen was then the Governor-designate for Queensland, the compliment of seeking his recommended nominations. The son of a lower class, middle class clergyman, Bowen sought candidates with sufficient wealth who aspired to be members of the Legislative Council, not the Legislative Assembly. In this, he was ably assisted by the aristocratic Robert Herbert, his principal private secretary, who on the 12th of December 1859 became the colonial secretary and later became the premier of the new colony. On the, of the first 11 members, all appointed for five year terms on the 1st of May uh, 1860 by Denison, seven were pastoralists, while Sir Charles Nicholson and Maurice O'Connell had pastoral interests. George Fullerton was a medical practitioner and John Galloway a gentleman, an urban property developer, as you were. By, eight, by May 1865, only four of the first 11 nominees of, to the Legislative Council remained in Queensland. The first four appointed by Bowen for life following the parliamentary meeting on the 22nd of May, in the afternoon, Bowen appointed four people, Henry Fitz, a pastoralist, Daniel Roberts, a lawyer, a solicitor, I should say, Stephen Simpson, a friend of the pastoralists, a one-time medical practitioner and public servant of Walston, who only was able to attend one sitting of the house. That's when he was sworn in. Obviously, it was a great appointment and obviously got bored very quickly. George Harris, the other appointment, was a Brisbane merchant. After his arrival in Sydney, Bowen approached Nicholson, a man both respected and with parliamentary experience, to become not only a member of the Upper House, but also president of the Legislative Council. Bowen believed that it was important for the first parliament to be established under the presidency of a gentleman held in high esteem with legislative experience and capabilities. Now, Nicholson had a great deal of prestige because he'd been created a baronet as a mark of the Queen's approval for the great job he did and the way he handled the Legislative Council of New South Wales for 11 years prior to 1856. He filled the office of Speaker. Now, Bowen appointed Nicholson, age 51, a businessman, scholar and medical practitioner from Edinburgh as president. Nicholson was born in Yorkshire, was christened Isaac Ascoff. He was the illegitimate son of Barbara Ascoff, the daughter of a labourer. Well, his father was unknown. After his mother died, when he was age five, he was able, because of his brilliance, to attend the Edinburgh University. And uh, eventually, he was being raised by his un uncle and aunt, came to New South Wales to visit another uncle, a very wealthy uncle, whose inheritance he quickly in inherited as this uncle passed away just after he arrived. Now, Nicholson only accepted the presidency out of a sense of public duty, because like others, he had arranged to return to England. Anyway, he agreed to accept the presidency for a period of three months, and after that, at the end of August, resigned, because as I say, he was going to return to England. Now, we have the situation that following Nicholson on the 28th of uh, August, 1860, Maurice O'Connell, was appointed by Bowen as president of the Legislative Council. Now, age 48, O'Connell was a professional soldier. He was also a public servant. After five years, O'Connell was then reappointed for a 
from the 1st of May 1865 for life by the Herbert government. Now we've gone from Bowen appointments, the governor, to the government appointments. Educated in Europe, he was the grandson of Governor William Bly of New South Wales fame. O'Connell had been elected a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council from 1845 and three years later became the Commissioner of Crown Lands in the Burnett District and then went on to become the Resident Commissioner at Port Curtis. O'Connell was appointed a Minister without portfolio in the first Herbert Government, which meant he didn't get paid. Respected by the pastoralists, he took an active role in education and defence of the colony. He was knighted in 1868. O'Connell died in office in this very house in March 1879. Now, Ipswich uh, uh, was proposed to be the capital by many, and prior to separation, Ipswich had the North Australian Club, which was a great success and provided a meeting place for the pastoralists. As Brisbane would now be the seat of government, the pastoralists thought, well, particularly the Darling Downs Pure Merinos, we should be looking at a, a club in the new capital. And that's exactly what happened. Solicitor Daniel Roberts, who I mentioned a few moments ago, saw the chance to gain increased legal business from the pastoralists and become a leader in establishing the Queensland Club. He obtained suitable premises and uh, is believed soon after, in early January 1860, became the first president of the club. And he was president on a number of occasions. Herbert was also a foundation member of the club. Now, Roberts remained actively involved in the club during his lifetime, as did Herbert while he was here. As members of the Legislative Council of Queensland, the, the club was extremely important because pastoralists and members of the Legislative Council functioned as individuals without any political party structure. The Queensland Club was the ideal place for them, them to meet and discuss policies and issues and decide on all things big and small, or great and small, is it? A mockery was soon made of the principle laid down by Denison and uh, Bowen that an unsuccessful candidate in the lower house, that's the Legislative Assembly, should not be appointed to the Legislative Council. Now, Roberts had failed by three votes to defeat Charles Lilly in the Valley electorate. And age 36, Roberts was appointed by Bowen immediately following the first city of the, of the Legislative Council. On the 30th of May, on the motion of O'Connell, Roberts was elected the first chairman of committees. Leaving his convict relatives in Sydney, Roberts, a solicitor, arrived in Brisbane in 1851 and established his legal practice. Over the decades, others would be appointed to the upper house in similar circumstances, such as Liberal Charles Buzzacott, a newspaper editor and proprietor nominated by the McElraith government. The early merchant appointed, or the only merchant rather, appointed by Bowen was of course uh, George Harris. He married Jan Thorne, the sister of future Premier George Thorne, as it so happens. George Thorne Jr, who was born in London, in, uh, or Paris was born in London rather in 1831 and came out here to join his brother in his business here in Brisbane, uh, it was a mercantile and shipping agency. Two years later, he became a partner. In the 1870s, Harris speculated in mining ventures in Gympie and Stanthorpe. And uh, they weren't very successful because he lost heavily in those ventures. You know, on the 31st of August, 1876, George Harris resigned from the Legislative Council, his firm having been declared insolvent. His prompt... He was prominent in the Brisbane business circles and was at various times the consul for the United States of America, Italy and Belgium. In 1862, he leased a place called Newstead House and later purchased the property where he entertained lavishly until he lost in bankruptcy proceedings the lot. The upper house gained great prestige in March 1861 when the Secretary of State for the Colonies provided Bowen with a supplementary dormant commission, nominating the president of the Legislative Council as the Lieutenant Governor in the absence of, uh, of, of, of another Lieutenant Governor being permanently appointed. Now, this is a great prestigious moment because the letters patent had stipulated that the Colonial Secretary was to be the Premier and would fill the position, who was the Premier, I should say, the Colonial Secretary, would then fill the position 
in the absence of the Lieutenant Governor being appointed permanently. O'Connell acted as Acting Governor on four occasions. Following disagreement in the appointment of members of the Legislative Council, which needed to be clarified by the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Bowen was advised in February 1863 when the, that uh, members of the Upper House should be appointed by the Government of the day, that is, Ministers of the Crown, not by the Governor in his own right. We see John Douglas, who was a typical British aristocrat, who came to Australia and ultimately Queensland, a classical liberal with a university degree. Douglas became a pastoralist and decided to enter politics. He entered politics because he looked forward to it to being a kind of relaxation. As you do, you always enter politics for relaxation. <laughs> Firstly in the Legislative Assembly and then in February 1866, Age 37, Douglas was appointed by the first Liberal McAllister government to the Legislative Council. He was given the portfolio of post Postmaster General and represented the government in the Upper House. He was paid in this case because he had a portfolio. Douglas was strongly supportive of closer settlement and agricultural production and was strenuously opposed by the pastoralists. He must have been in great trouble in the Upper House. He went on to become Premier. Also on the same day as Douglas was appointed pastoralist conservative Thomas Murray Pryor, aged 46. P Murray Pryor was appointed as postmaster general uh, in due course and represented conservative pastoral governments on three occasions in the upper house and after Robert's death in 1889, became chairman of committees. Murray Pryor's daughter Rosa, married Arthur Prade and won literary fame. fame. I'm sure many of you are, have heard of her. George Thorne Jr was the only man to be commissioned Premier while in a member of the Legislative Council. Now age 33, a Liberal, he was appointed in January 1874 by the second Liberal McAllister government to the Upper House as Postmaster General and a representative of the government. With McAllister's appointment as Agent General to London, in 1876, Thorne was commissioned to form a government. However, Thorne quickly found it impossible to govern from the Upper House and 11 days later resigned from the Upper House, contested McAllister's vacant seat in Ipswich, won the seat and went on to become Premier in the Lower House. As prisoners, though, had been established in Britain, no exception was taken to Thorne's appointment from the Upper House. For nine years, pastoralist and stock and station agent Boyd Moorhead had been a member for Mitchell in the Legislative Assembly. Following the resignation of Buzzacott, McElraith appointed the ultra-conservative Moorhead, at age 37, to the Legislative Council as Postmaster General in an attempt to buy him off. What a great failure that was. However, it was not successful as Moorhead continued to cause unrest in McElraith's party and was re-elected to the Legislative Assembly in October 18. He was one of 20 businessmen, pastorals, solicitors and many others from the regions of Queensland appointed to the Upper House during the first Liberal McElraith government. On the death of O'Connell, as President on the 3rd of April 1879, Conservative pastoralist Joshua Peter Bell, aged 52, was appointed by the Liberal McElraith government as a member and President of the Legislative Council. Now, Michael Wraith and his senior minister, Sir Arthur Palmer, appointed Bell to ensure the government retained the influence over the pastoralists. And although Bell was not part of the Michael Wraith ministry, he was previously a minister in the Palmer government, including colonial treasurer. Bell's property, Jimbor, you've heard of, was famous as one of the best managed sheep stations in Queensland. And Bell was quite influential. He was leader of the Darling Downs Pure Merino Pastoralists. Bell was a member and president of the Legislative Council uh, and the Queensland Club of Pre uh, I should mention to say. Previously, he was a member of the North Australian Club. You see how the, the situation flows, the, the tenuous connections. After serving as president for a little more than two years, Bell, though, collapsed and died in Queen Street in a cab. Now we've got the situation that following Bell's death, Premier Palmer, Premier McElraith, rather, four days later, appointed 
Pastoralist Sir Arthur Palmer, aged 61, as a member and president of the Legislative Council. Palmer was Premier from May 1870 to January 1874. And on the 2nd of January 1874, some six days prior to losing office, he was appointed, he appointed six Conservative members of the Upper House. He had already appointed nine Conservative members uh, previously. After losing office, he handed over the leadership of his party to the laissez-faire Liberal, Thomas McElwraith, and Palmer became his right-hand man. Palmer had an adept political ability to keep the pastoralists within the McElwraith's party. Following the death of Bell, McElwraith and Palmer were aware of the importance in Palmer being appointed to influence the pastoralists. After all, it was essential to have pastoralist support in the upper house to pass government legislation. Palmer and McElwraith were brothers-in-law. Palmer served as acting governor. On several occasions, was appointed lieutenant governor in 1893. He remained president of the upper house until his death in March 1898. Now, Andrew Tyne, the name may be familiar to many of you, was admitted as a solicitor in December 1873. Now, Tyne was a brilliant solicitor, was appointed in January 1882 by the McElwraith government to the Legislative Council. He held at times ministerial portfolios and represented the government in the Legislative Council. He established a strong commercial practice, particularly with Edward McCartney, representing some of Queensland's largest corporations. A staunch Conservative, Tyne was fiercely opposed to the Labor Party and socialism. A Roman Catholic, he was still a member of the Legislative Council when it was abolished. Although he has never appointed to any ministerial office, explorer and surveyor, Augustus Gregory, aged 63, was appointed to the Legislative Council in November 1882 by the McElwraith government. Now, Gregory was a staunch Anglican, an ultra-conservative, a leading Freemason, was a continuous critic of government, of all persuasions, opposed to any social reform, and allied himself to the reactionary pastoral interests while being a regular speaker in the chamber. Following the death of Palmer and the pattern that had been developed, in April 1898, Sir Hugh Nelson resigned as Premier and Member of the Legislative Assembly, and on the same day, Nelson was appointed by the incoming Premier, Thomas Burns, both as a member and President of the Upper House. Age 64, he'd been Premier for four and a half years, Nelson was a very shrewd and ruthless political operator, a conservative pastoralist. Nelson remained in the position until January 1906, when he died at his home in Toowoomba. He migrated with his family from Ayrshire in 1853, his father being a Presbyterian clergyman. He developed a 40,000 acre of freehold property near Dolby, which became a leading sheep property a rearing property, and leader. He became leader in due course of the elite pure Merinos, the pastoral elites of Queensland. Nelson was president of the Legislative Council during a period of great economic and social transformation. But it all passed Nelson by. Now, other appointments during this uh, particular period. Uh, well, first of all, I should mention that Nelson was appointed by Thomas Burns, uh, the incoming Premier. Now, Thomas Burns was aged 29, born of poor Irish parents in Brisbane. He was appointed to the Legislative Council by the Griffith Waith Government, the Griffith Waith Government, got that, in August 1890, where he remained until he resigned in March 1893. He was recognised as a brilliant student and barrister by none other than Premier Sir Samuel Griffith and was appointed to represent the Government as a Minister in the Upper House with the title of Solicitor General to undertake Attorney General Griffith's everyday functions. Coming from a poor Irish background, it's uh, obvious that uh, he would be concerned about matters such as the uh, working, Workmen's Bill in 1891, which convinced many people that he was a genuine Liberal, a Conservative and a Roman Catholic. Burns was moved to the Legislative Assembly uh, and became Premier in 1898. He would be with Douglas and Moorhead, the last who served in the Legislative Council, then went on to the Legislative Assembly to become Premier. The coming to power of the Progressive Liberal and 
Labor Morgan Kitson governments witnessed the appointment of the first Labor members of the upper house. Albert Hinchcliffe, uh, manager of the working newspaper, Charles McGee, who was the co-owner of the Melbourne Alert, a weekly newspaper, and Peter Murphy, a hotel and property owner. But this had little effect on the Legislative Council, nor did the appointments of T.C. Burns or uh, Frank MacDonald of MacDonald and East. And as following the death of Nelson in 1906 at Anglican, Arthur Morgan, aged 49, was appointed a member and president of the Legislative Council by the incoming Premier, uh, William Kidston. Now, Morgan had become Premier with the support of farmers, progressive Liberals and Labor Party members. Morgan broke the pattern of previous presidents, not having either been a pastoralist nor a, with a higher education university. He was a self-educated person, having learnt the job as a journalist becoming a newspaper editor and proprietor. He worked with his father, taking over the newspaper in Warwick. In 1909, I should say, Morgan's great achievement was the fact that in 1905 he had passed the Elections Act Amendment Act, which provided female franchise in Queensland. Hence my mother, grandmother and her sisters enrolled. In 1909, Morgan was appointed Lieutenant Governor and was still President when he died on the 20th of December, 1916. Morgan was the first President of the Royal Historical Society of Queensland, when it was formed on the 21st of August, 1913, as the Historical Society of Queensland. The significance of pastoral industries to the colony's economy and wealth sustained the culture and pattern of the upper house. The appointment of minority of Liberals had little or no effect on this culture. Thank you, Denver. There's so many names to remember, but um, if you're interested, the, uh, the Parliament has the full listing of the 195 members on our website with a little bit about their parliamentary career. And indeed, if you haven't noticed it, we have an honour board just in the corridor here. On your, it'll be on your right on the way out where we do the full listing of the names. And the Parliamentary Library, as part of this um, commemoration, has developed an interactive map which maps all the interconnections between these 195 members and you'll be able to have a look at that on our website as well. Our next speaker is Emeritus Professor Kay Saunders AO. Kay is one of Australia's leading professional historians. In a former life she was the Professor of Modern History at UQ and a Senator there at the University and she was also the CEO of the Brisbane Institute. Her address today is titled the beginning of the end. Would you please join me in welcoming Emeritus Professor Kay Saunders. Mr Speaker, members of the House, uh, past and present, distinguished guests. I come to you like Vera Stanhope, whom you all know. I have taken off my Wellingtons and I have put on another coat because what I'm here to do for you today is to find out why did an organisation, this body that was so healthy, so resilient, so confident, suddenly die in 1922? And we will look at the death blow that Professor Carney will take up. But what I'm going to do is lead you through some of the clues as to the demise. So this is the second paper that Lynn and I wrote. So we've written back-to-back -back papers, even though we've got someone in, in the middle as well. Now, of course, the beginning of the end is what my paper is called. It didn't suddenly appear in the 10-hour acrimonious debate on the 23rd of October 1921, when the Legislative Assembly voted overwhelmingly to abolish the Upper House. For the origins of this extraordinary political and constitutional event occurred even before the Legislative Council's establishment on the 1st of May 1860. The diverse disquiet held by the Liberals, the Conservatives and Radicals alike in the debates and manoeuvres to separate 
the northern districts of New South Wales and to establish self-government sowed the seeds of eventual destruction. So one might say there's some genetic problem with the house in the beginning. Acrimonious debate centred for decades around the purely nominated character of the house. Money bill powers and class associations rather than the merits of bicameralism. Issues such as the resolution of deadlocks, the status of money bills, which were not addressed at, the, at its inception, nor were they addressed in the 1867 Constitution of Queensland, proved overwhelming, indeed frustratingly insurmountable. The predominance of tenure allowed the councillors to behave all too often with arrogance and overconfidence in their duties and deliberations. The legislative program of elective governments of all political persuasions were hindered, stalled and rejected. As, as, as Dr Beanland said, they're, not meant, they're appointed as individuals. They don't have any party alliance, so they make decisions as individuals and often not very wise decisions. I would have to say. Now, clue one. In the time from December 1859 until the establishment of the parliament in May 1860, Queensland effectively operated as a crown colony, ruled in name by the governor, Sir George Bowen, but I think effectively by his aristocratic and conservative private secretary, Robert Herbert, whose cousin, Henry Herbert, the third Earl of Carnarvon, served as Secretary of State for the Colonies in 1858 and 59. Now, is that a link to power? Unrivaled in British colonial history. Hence, the young Robert Herbert was the conduit to the highest level of power and privilege in Britain. In essence, class privilege and noble lineage won out over academic merit. Bowen, like Sir Samuel Griffith later, was a clever lower middle class boy, a scholarship holder from the outer edges of Great Britain. Sir Samuel being Welsh and um, as, uh, Sir, Sir George being Irish. Especially when he married by some fluke, I mean, he was an incredibly dull dog. I mean, you know, he, he, he's not, you know, he wouldn't do well on, on married at first sight. <laughs> he somehow marries the Countess Diamantina Roma from the small Greek British settlement of the Ionian Islands. Now, she was the 10th of the 11th children. So I could see in an era when women had arranged marriages and you had a dowry, there was not much left in the kitty for um, Countess Diamantina. She had either spinsterhood, uh, looking forward, or she could marry, you know, practically someone who was so poor she'd be out there harnessed to the horse doing the work. So along comes St George and he is her saviour and he gets her into the world. Very, very strange pair, this one. Um, but it's not simply idle chat about marriage and kinship that will figure in the story about how the structure of the Legislative Council evolved. Because clue two, the sole Supreme Judge in Queensland, Alfred Lutwidge, advised Bowen in early January 1860, that is, he simply got off the boat and he says, look, I've got to tell you a few things, fella. Uh, the new colony's constitution that you've come to rule over, its foundations and suffrage uh, provisions were erroneous and they require modification. Now, we may ask, of course, why did the governor and Herbert entirely ignore his appraisal in the light of his judicial role and his reputation as an eminent legal scholar in England. Now, I think there's a fairly clear reason. 
Lutwidge was the son of a London tradesman. He was the friend of the radical investigative novelist and journalist Charles Dickens, who trawled through the dark side of Victorian England. Moreover, Lutwidge had been a radical parliamentarian who had held office in New South Wales. He supported all the radical liberals, the, the Langites, the, those Calvinist Langites that were here. Um, Bowen and Herbert essentially confuse Lutwich's considered legal opinion with what they saw as his appalling politics and even, I think, more telling, his personal circumstances. He had married his housekeeper. And this had made him unfit to become Lieutenant Governor. I mean, she... She wasn't even in any way a lady. She, she was, as my grandmother used to say, there were ladies, women and persons, and she was definitely a person. <laughs> now, what this meant by marrying so badly in class terms was that the, the justice of the Supreme Court could not be invited to Government House on social occasions. Um, he couldn't be invited to dinner parties, even though they were men only. He couldn't be invited to a dinner party because he had made such an appalling marriage. He suffered further professional humiliation because of his private life and his beliefs then by not becoming Chief Justice. I mean, these guys can be spiteful. If we step back from untangling how decisions were made, it is clear the whole history and fate of the Legislative Council could have been different right at that outset had Governor Bowen and Herbert listened to Lutwich, because later it is agreed that, in fact, he was right, a clerical error had been made and he had picked it up. Um, However, history is really not about the what if, even though it's interesting to play it, it's about what happened and why. So clue three. It is not as if Lutwich's legal opinion was a guarded secret. Those who followed the political and constitutional process in the new colony readily discerned that they had been deprived by the, 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 uh, the new, more progressive elements of the 1855 New South Wales Constitution that brought in responsible government on, on a more, with a more liberal franchise, but in fact they had got the provisions of an earlier act. The progressive and liberal uh, radical candidates in the first elections to the Legislative Assembly held in April 1860 actively supported an elected upper house Governor Sir George Bowen neatly sidestepped the issue in his opening address to Parliament. As he stated, I am convinced you will patiently set to work to amend whatever may be found amiss in the manner appointed, at, appointed out by Her Majesty in the Order of Council. Now these were incredibly hollow words. All attempts to amend or revise the conventions were sidestepped or rejected as his term as governor till 1866 progressed. Clue four. A year after the inauguration, the inaugural Queensland Parliament met, the powers of the New South Wales Legislative Council were contested by threats of swamping, as they called it, by putting in many more new members by the new Liberal Premier. The reformist Cowper Robertson Ministries wanted the more democratic franchise from the lower house to be reflected in the upper house. Now, Queensland parliamentary Liberals followed events in New South Wales. Newspapers at this time were excellent and followed in great detail because there's no television or, or internet or anything. New newspapers were the source of, of, of information and they were extremely good and very, very detailed. 
On the 8th of May 1861, two days before the intended swamping in New South Wales, future Queensland Premiers, Liberal Premiers Charles Lilly and Arthur McAllister attempted to introduce motions in the Legislative Assembly here to censure the nominee principle. So this is the first, the first time we have um, parliamentarians actually in the parliament trying to contest what's happened. They were overruled totally by Robert Herbert, who was now the Premier, who used his aristocratic sang-froid to deter any progressive initiatives and stopped the conversation right there. Middle-class lawyers were not to defy his authority. And unfortunately, they deferred to his or, or aristocratic authority. However, they understood British parliamentary conventions and progress, and they persisted. In, in effect, King Charles I's hauteur had, had, was not the appropriate behaviour in Westminster, let alone in the colonial meritocracy that was Queensland. And I think Herbert, who leaves the, the, the colony in disgrace, should have, have really realised this. McAllister again unsuccessfully introduced another motion for an elected upper house a week later, criticising the six new nominations to the Queensland Legislative Council made by Sir George Bowen. Responsive to the drama unfolding in New South Wales, some Queensland Legislative Councillors heeded what they saw as a warning. On the 22nd of May, 1861, the more independent-minded pastoralist, William Yalwin, proposed a notice paper recommending an elective upper house. And this is the first time this happens in the upper house. He believed the highly restrictive suffrage requirement of the Victorian Legislative Council constituted an appropriate hybrid model. In his dispatches, however, back to the colonial office, Bowen also saw the wisdom of Yalwin's proposals. As he said, it was the, it was the ultimate, uh, I suppose, mechanism that, that could, uh, could allow the Legislative Council to remain conservative. Here we can see how Bowen and Herbert disagreed fundamentally with Herbert totally rejecting any notions of elections to the upper house. He wanted it far more like a strange hybrid House of Lords. Now, clue five. In his opening address to the parliament in 1862, Bowen confidently foreshadowed an elective legislative council bill. This was to be shepherded through the Legislative Assembly by the Liberal Arthur McAllister, who had now, for some reason unknown, had joined the Herbert Ministry. I think, I think he um, was possibly a little ambitious, I think, here. In return for an elected upper house, a literacy franchise was proposed instead of universal man manhood suffrage. And given the proportion of the white male population that were of convict origin at the time, I think this was not, a, was, was not an unreasonable suggestion. Liberal MLA Ratcliffe Pring proposed a partially elected 20-member council. Strict franchise provisions similar to those in Victoria were proposed, and this would ensure the conservative demeanour of the upper house. But President Maurice O'Connell rejected these reforms outright as contrary to the spirit of the British Constitution in so much as two elective houses, he said, could not afford any constitutional check on the other. Again, when the opportunity to reform the Legislative Council was rejected, we can see that the long-term consequences were the key clues for its, for its um, eventual demise. Now, clue six. In a confidential letter to uh, Sir Frederick Rogers, Bowen admitted 
that he said life nominees are a positive evil. They have no real sense of responsibility to the, to the crown or the people. He, in fact, of course, he went out horse riding with these often chinless wonders. And he, in conversation with them, and of course, he would have been so delighted. Here he was, an Irish lower middle class boy out with these members of the British aristocracy and, and, um, and, uh, and gentry, even though um, people like um, so, uh, the Honourable Louis Hope refused to meet him because he simply didn't mix with the middle classes and, ma and made this quite public. Um, he, he, by these social conventions, could see what they were like. And he, he's, as he said, they were only here to amass money and then sell off and live in England. So he, he can see their, what, what should, their deficiencies. Clue seven. There were intermittent attempts to reform the upper house in the following session. Councillor uh, Dr William Hobbs, the surgeon on D John Donmore Lang's Chasley in 1849, proposed in July 1863 a 20-member house from one constituency with moderate property qualifications or a university degree or medical education as suffrage. He got nowhere. It didn't even appear on the notice paper. Clue eight. Two years later, Premier Herbert's close friend and domestic partner, the Attorney General John Bramston. Now, I find this photo fascinating because Herbert has his arm on his, on his friend's shoulder. Not the usual photo. I think that can tell you. I think that that's the big hint about these fellas. <laughs> um, Bramston, strangely enough, has somewhat different ideas from Herbert. And he wishes to propose, as Attorney General, a similar bill, which would be the Queensland Legislative Council Bill. And it would provide for um, elected upper house members. Very strange. Now, what what is even stranger is it passed the it passed the legislative council. Then, when it comes into debate in the legislative assembly, there was not a quorum of the two thirds majority that they have to have to pass any constitutional matters. Members at this time weren't paid; they were often very slack in attendance. Something else might have been interesting on. It might have been their dinner break. Who knows? But whatever happens, I don't think there was any conspiracy. They simply do not have the two-thirds majority. And that one time that it actually could have gone through, you're lacking several members of the Legislative Assembly to be there to vote yes. I mean, just an absolute irony of history. To get back to the Contessa, now, I find this really interesting as well. She found the company of Herbert and Bramston in their home, Hurston, most congenial. She travelled frequently to visit them privately and without her husband. She, of course, had no need for a chaperone in this particular household. We can imagine the aristocratic Contessa and Herbert were kindred spirits with her leaning towards the opinion of Herbert rather than her husband, whose birth and heritage were so different from her own. Bramston, however, was far more progressive. Middle class, upper middle class upbringing, he had met Herbert at Oxford. And um, like many middle class lawyers, he had a very good understanding of liberalism and he was far more in tune with the emerging society based on talent and, and merit rather than birth. But his one attempt to, to um, 
to really go against her but failed because those fellows did not turn up for that particular meeting in the Legislative Assembly. Thus it was a strange meeting of fate in the Legislative Assembly that day in 1865. And it was one that was never repeated. It was never attempted and never repeated. One could say, had that gone through, the whole history of Queensland's parliamentary system would have been different. We would not be sitting in this beautiful chamber at all, would we? We would be standing outside or up in the visitors gallery. Now, the other thing uh, I've got to, um, to go through is that, as Denver alluded, many of the legislative councillors had been, even in 1922, had been appointed in the 1860s. 18, sorry, the 1880s. I mean, they were literally old boys, old walruses in their 80s and 90s. And they, I think, were confident that they could dismiss any reforms when you got progressive or Labor governments coming in because they had actually beaten Sir Samuel Griffith back in 1885 when he proposed paid members under an appropriation bill and tried to fiddle the, the, the budget papers with payment of, of members of parliament. And um, they defeated him. It did go to the Privy Council, but it didn't go through. So I think the people like Hoistler and Tyne, who had sat in the Legislative Council in 1885, had said, now listen, fellas, over their whiskies in the, in the Queensland Club, we beat Sir Samuel Griffith. He is the most brilliant lawyer in Australia. He did the criminal code. I mean, presuming they could, um, you know, knew all this. Well, they would. And he's now the Chief Justice of the High Court. We beat him. Let's forget. The, these liberal, radical and Labor people, they're going to come and go. We've beat them. We're the strong ones. All we have to do is be resolute, as we did with, with Kidston, the Labor Premier that had come in, a very, very talented man, we withstood his, 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 his urgings. He did bring in a referendum, but we've ignored that. Just stand firm. How firm we were, we can see when, when Professor Carney talks about the death process, the, what we could call the autopsy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kay, for sharing uh, some of that great detective work of yours and giving us a couple of laughs along the way. So welcome back, and uh, this, we have two more fascinating speakers this morning. Uh, the next speaker is Dr Gerard Carney, who is an expert in constitutional law. His address is titled, A Labor Aspiration Realised, the Abolition of the Legislative Council 1915 to 1922. Please join me in welcoming Dr Gerard Carney. Many thanks, Janet, and thank you for the invitation to, to speak. Um, my job is obviously to describe the death of this body, the Legislative Council. Uh, it's a bit late to undertake a post-mortem, I suppose, a century after its uh, demise, but uh, my, my uh, objective in, pre in preparing for this paper was really to work out who were responsible uh, for the, for the uh, demise of the Legislative Council, and why? Why did they vote uh, themselves out of existence? And so I had tremendous fun visiting the State Archives, John Oxley Library, the State Library. I uh, discovered the minutes of the Parliamentary Labor Party for this period, 1915 to 1922. The Cabinet documents are not available, that they don't exist for that period. Um, but I do have a plea. I would love to hear from and I'm sure the Parliamentary Library and the Society would love to hear from any descendants of the Suicide Squad uh, or members of Parliament during that period uh, 
uh, who are here today who may have uh, family letters or other information or, or, or memoirs of, of, their, of their ancestors involved in this um, particular story. The abolition of this Legislative Council in this room is probably the most significant constitutional event uh, in Australian history um, at a state level, other than Federation itself. And of course, we're not, we are unique in Australia being the only jurisdiction to have abolished an upper house, but we're not unique across the world. New Zealand did exactly the same thing, effective from the 1st of January 1951. Uh, and provinces in Canada had also abolished their upper houses even before uh, the debates here in 1915 to 1921. The most interesting case, I think, of an abolition of a house occurred in the United States of, oh, sorry, in the state of the United States called Nebraska, where I understand that it went the other way. The upper house got rid of the lower house. <laughs> and that never occurred to our distinguished members of the upper house here, I don't think, but it's a thought. Um, in a nutshell, and in a way, my story has already been said to you this morning by the, Her Excellency the Governor. She gave a very accurate overview of exactly what I was going to tell you. Um, <laughs> but in a way, uh, uh, what I'm trying to do, of course, is explain how it happened, why it happened, who were responsible in some detail. But in essence, of course, it was the result of good fortune. Most historical events, I suspect, have an element of good fortune or bad fortune involved in them. We certainly had, Labor certainly had good fortune in achieving its, its aspiration. I call it really a dream uh, to abolish the upper house. Um, but it was sheer political will and savvy on the part of two of the principal characters in this story. And it was, as Kay has indicated, the sheer doggedness, defiance, recalcitrance of the members of the, of the upper house who had been there for, for many years and many of whom were still members uh, in 1921. Um, only 10 of those members of the upper house voted against abolition out of, out of 35 members. Only 10 voted. Um, the rest didn't even bother to turn up. So, in a way, I, talk, I describe this story as one which begins in 1915 with political assassination as the primary objective of Labor, and by the time they achieve it in 1922, it's really political euthanasia of a body that has become defunct, useless, and everyone basically agrees uh, that it needs to go. And throughout this, the one innocent party to this entire uh, process of, of killing off uh, this Legislative Council uh, were the people of Queensland, who, when given the single opportunity to indicate their opinion on this matter, voted in favour of retaining the Legislative Council by an enormous majority in 19, 1917, uh, and were never consulted after that. So, we are the innocent descendants. Our ancestors are innocent of this. The blood is on other hands. So I shall begin. Uh, in 1915, Queensland's first majority Labor government uh, was elected under the char charismatic leadership of Mr TJ Ryan. Mr Ryan, a graduate of Melbourne Law School, uh, born in Victoria, uh, of a class quite different from the traditional Labor voter with no background in unionism, ended up as a barrister with successful uh, practice representing unions in Rockhampton and managed through sheer charm, intellect uh, and ability to convince uh, his Labor colleagues that despite his class, uh, he was one of them and he was incredibly loyal to that organisation. So within a few years of being elected to the Queensland Parliament, in 1915, he ends up the, the leader and the premier of the government. And he faces a, um, a state 
in turmoil, uh, it's in the middle of a world war. Gallipoli had just occurred a month before his election in May 1915. The state of Queensland was suffering a severe drought, rising unemployment, growing union militarism, and the increasing demands of both the empire and the commonwealth uh, in terms of providing resources and support for the war effort. And on top of all this, there were internal frictions within the labor movement itself following the, um, the Russian Revolution in 1917. So things didn't get better, they just got gradually worse as the government uh, proceeded to take office in May 1915. And indeed, one could say that the Labor government was facing a world, a convulsion, a world in convulsion uh, for the next decade. So in the midst of this maelstrom, the Ryan government has to face the 39 members sitting in this chamber, only four of whom were ever identified as supporters of the Labor program. Andrew Tyne was still here, Patrick Lay as well, two very prominent conservative members as Kay has already uh, outlined uh, in this chamber. And they refused to bend to the will of the people. How was, how was Ryan to, to combat this opposition? What was his strategy? It's, it's hard to know initially what he thought about that, but there was a clear proposition that the electoral platform of the Labor Party was to abolish the upper house. And that was the platform of Labor throughout the country, to abolish every upper house in Australia, including, um, uh, sorry, in addition to abolishing this, the office of state governor. That's why I think they're more dreams than, asp than maybe aspirations, but certainly uh, the office of state governor, as we saw physically today, is still hale and healthy uh, in our state. So what were the options that, that um, uh, Mr Ryan thought he might have had to resolve this obstruction in the upper house? There were only two legal options. And he was a talented constitutional lawyer, so he understood these very well. The first option was to swamp the upper house with new members. That had happened in New South Wales. It was accepted practice that if the government of the day, having won particularly a good election in the lower house with a good majority, didn't have um, much support in the upper house, that it was acceptable to make new appointments to the upper house to reflect uh, that change in the lower house. Not necessarily appointments to swamp it completely and give them a majority, but at least um, give them some basis uh, for, for uh, being represented adequately in the upper house. And the second option that he knew was to hold a referendum to abolish the upper house under a 1908 statute that Mr Kidston's government had earlier enacted. And under that legislation, called the Parliamentary Bills Referendum Act of 1908, a bill rejected twice by the upper house uh, during a certain period of time could then be submitted to the people at a referendum. And if the people voted in favour of that bill, then it would be signed into law by royal assent. Ryan, over the next three years, tried both of those options and he failed on both. His first option was to pursue the referendum one. And the reason for that seems to have been the Parliamentary Labor Caucus favoured that option. They preferred to let the people decide about the abolition of the upper house. I think they thought their own particular program of social reform, uh, which was creating a legal social economic revolution in this state, would be so popular that, that if the upper house was obstructing in that way, then the people would vote them out of existence. So it took six months. Um, but Ryan, was, Ryan eventually lost patience with the upper house obstruction of, of, of key, uh, key labour reforms in relation to workers' compensation, um, state government insurance office, uh, and 
closer settlement of lands uh, and reforms to pastoral leases. The key social reforms of the, of the Ryan government were all uh, obstructed in the upper house with only four Labor members there. So the bill to abolish the upper house was introduced in 1915. Uh, it took a year or two for the bill to be twice rejected in the upper house as you would expect. And then there was a little bit of a delay but eventually the referendum was held uh, in 1917 on the 5th of June, I think, I'm trying to see, um, which was the same date as the federal election. So in, it was in June, uh, nine, so, so I'll just get the date right. It was May, sorry, May 1917. So the... Um, the Ryan government decided to hold the referendum on the same day as the federal election of May 1917. It was also a day of another referendum liquor licence issue around the Brisbane area. The decision was only announced really a month before uh, the holding of that referendum on the federal election day and within a few weeks uh, members of the Upper House here brought an application in the Supreme Court of Queensland for an injunction to prevent the holding of the referendum. Uh, TJ Ryan, a talented lawyer, appeared for Queensland. He argued in the Supreme Court. He managed to get um, a, uh, a, um, of the right to transfer the matter, an appeal to the High Court of Australia. The High Court of Australia heard the argument uh, a few days before the referendum. TJ Ryan went to Sydney for that argument uh, and the day before the referendum was to be held, uh, the High Court lifted the injunction uh, in Queensland and permitted the referendum to proceed, but left open the legality of the whole process. They didn't determine the legality of the abolition or the potential abolition or the legality of the referendum. They just allowed the referendum to go ahead and they would sort out the consequences later. Can you imagine a decision being brought down in Sydney on a Friday and the people of Queensland turning up to the electoral booths the next day to vote on a very acrimonious federal election where TJ Ryan and all his colleagues had been engaged in electioneering for the federal ALP uh, and having no time to really deal with this issue of the abolition of the upper house. So there was confusion um, and the vote, as I said, went very badly. 60,000 votes against abolition was the majority uh, vote. Uh, it was compulsory voting in Queensland at that time. Uh, so it was a humiliation in terms of this issue of abolition of the upper house. The Ryan government never really accepted it. Um, and that's why in the end the abolition occurred without ever having another referendum. Uh, and the government always explained that it would re ignore that referendum result because of the, of the legal confusion on the day, uh, the fact it coincided with the federal election, and the fact that the Ryan government was returned to power twice, in 1918 and then in 1920, uh, despite the outcome of that referendum result. So, the referendum's a dismal failure. So obviously, TJ Ryan says, well, we'll go to option two now. Option two is to approach the governor, uh, Sir Hamilton Gould Adams, uh, to, to uh, swamp the House with extra members. And, uh, and that occurs uh, in 1917. Sorry, 1918. And... The governor only agreed to the appointment of 13. So um, a, a four Labor supporters out of 39 increases to uh, 17 uh, out of whatever, but still not a majority. So, and the governor agreed to this on the basis that it was important for the government to have a quorum in the upper house. So as we heard earlier, uh, members sometimes didn't turn up, uh, particularly to the upper house. Uh, they were country people, they, just, they were unpaid, uh, there were no 
party politics. There was no party discipline. They turned up if they wanted to. This was the most luxurious club in Queensland, apart from the, the Queensland Club. And uh, so the governor was happy to make that appointment uh, to provide extra numbers for the for the governor for the government in the upper house. But the upper house still blocked the labour programs. It didn't resolve the obstructionism. Why? Because of course they felt vindicated. The people had voted in 1917 that they were to remain. They were valued uh, House of Parliament. Also, they realised that that referendum procedure from the 1908 Act was the mechanism by which any disputes between the two houses could be resolved. That's how it happens in other jurisdictions. It can happen in Queensland. We will fight within this chamber to support our conservative views and we will block whatever Labor sends us and if Labor doesn't like that, they can go to the people for a referendum and we'll let the people decide. So the obstructionism continued. But of course, um, Labor was frightened of the referendum. It wouldn't, it, there was never another referendum under that 1908 Act on any topic whatsoever. So then there was a new election in 1918 and Labor was returned with an increased majority. Huge. It maintained its majority and increased it. Okay. So at this point, Ryan does go back to the governor, Gould Adams, to plead for more appointments to the upper house because of the mandate of the people. And the governor refuses. And Ryan has been criticised ever since for not making a stand. He could have threatened to resign. As go uh, the government could have threatened to resign if the governor didn't, didn't make the extra appointments to the upper house. But Ryan didn't take that stand. From my a small amount of research, uh, it seems clear that Ryan certainly raised the issue and did threaten the governor, but didn't follow through with it. There was a change of heart within the Parliamentary Labor Party. Um, they went back to their original idea, the option one of a referendum process. Uh, and at this moment, this is one of those opportunities in time where Ryan could have achieved uh, the swamping that he needed uh, had he taken a strong stand. But Ryan got on well with Gould Adams and vice versa. They seem to be able to talk to each other, respect each other, and it's possible that Ryan just didn't have that, that determination, that, that, uh, that commitment uh, to create a constitutional crisis. So the next stage in this story is that soon after... Um, into 1919, it became apparent that T.J. Ryan was one of the great stars of the Labor movement across Australia. Uh, he had successfully fought the conscription issues against uh, during World War I, and, uh, uh, and so he was persuaded to leave, resign as the Premier of Queensland in October 1919 uh, and, and stand for a federal seat. And so really that's where he ends in this story. Uh, one, I think, can, can credit with him three achievements towards the abolition of the Upper House. First, he proved that the option of a referendum wasn't really an option and it was never pursued again. Secondly, he was successful in getting constitutional judicial recognition of the power of the Queensland Parliament to abolish one of its own houses and to do so through the referendum procedure. And that... That issue that the High Court left open before the, the day before the referendum was, a few months later, resolved in Taylor's case. And the High Court found in favour of the Ryan government and, as I said, the capacity of the Queensland Parliament to abolish one of its own houses. And that's another theme of this story, <clears throat> the commitment to the rule of law um, and the uh, ability of the, of the Ryan government to to use its judicial, um, well, its, its legal options through the High Court and the Privy Council in many cases with great success. Um, good fortune shone on Labor in that respect as well. <clears throat> 
And the third achievement of, of Ryan was to at least get the first swamping of the upper house so that the numbers were increased and Labor realised that they only needed one further swamping and they would probably have control. So the opportunity arose uh, with the changeover from TJ Ryan to his deputy, uh, Ted, Ted Theodore, known as Red Ted, who was a very different person from Ryan. He was younger, he was only 34, and as Denver's told me, he's not the youngest Premier in Australian history, but he's, he's certainly uh, one of the younger ones. Uh, and he came from a completely different background, Romanian father, English mother, born in South Australia, went all over Australia as a minor, ends up in Queensland setting up the Australian Workers' Union, uh, incredible labour credentials, uh, and, and yet a man that's quiet, self-educated, uh, eventually walked around with a walking stick with a gold nib on top um, and became a very famous federal treasurer. So I've realised I need to, to keep going. He, um, so the first thing he did when he becomes the Premier is that he runs, literally runs to, the, to Governor Gould Adams and says, we, we must have a new Lieutenant Governor. I know you're going. So Gould Adams had just announced that he was retiring in a few months' time. And the government in the UK hadn't appointed a replacement. So Theodore runs to, um, uh, runs to Gould Adams and says, we've got to appoint a Lieutenant Governor. Because the position of left Lieutenant Governor had been vacant for some years. Uh, and so they picked William Lennon. Now, William Lennon's selection was extraordinary because he was the Speaker of the other house. Uh, and he was a member of the, of the Parliament, the lower house. Um, but the Governor agreed with this idea because he went through the options. Well, the Chief Justice, um, Sir, Sir Hope, Pope Cooper, um, he didn't like it all. He was cantankerous and very difficult man, totally unsuitable, he said. Um, the next person would have been the president of this chamber, uh, William Hamilton, uh, who was um, unacceptable because he had a criminal record. Um, in fact, he was the one of the great Labour martyrs. He had been instrumental in the Shearer's strike in 1891 in Queensland. He had been convicted of criminal offences and he had served his full three-year term on St Helena Island. And at a point when he was being, he was asked, you know, he was invited to leave early, he said, no, I'm not going to leave early, I'm here to serve my full term. An extraordinary man. So as Denver pointed out to me in our discussions before this, to a point William Hamilton to be the president of this Legislative Council with all these cantankerous conservative members was like a red rag to a bull. I mean, he was hardly going to, um, to uh, uh, appease the situation. So William Lennon is appointed because they had no one else, which is true. Um, the extraordinary thing is that, that they tried to appoint him. Uh, they wanted him to be appointed but still remain, as Lieutenant Governor, but still remain Speaker of the Lower House. So the Colonial Office went crazy and said, no, that's not going to work. But in the end, he gets appointed. Um, and so what happens next is that he achieves the second swamping. Of course he does what Theodore wants him to do, and he appoints 14 new members to the Upper House. So for the first time in February 1920, Labor has the majority numbers in the Upper House. 20 months passes before the abolition bill is passed in both houses to take effect in 1922. And that was the other query. Why take 20 months? Was Theodore really interested in getting rid of the upper house? Were there doubts about the value, particularly when they had control? So in the paper that's going to be published, and I've got to stop in a moment now, but I come up with three, three or four reasons why I think Theodore deliberately had to delay the abolition of the Upper House in 1920 because he faced a financial crisis in London. The London banks, thanks to the Conservative members of this House, had decided not to grant any more loans. So he couldn't abolish the Upper House until he had some security for the finances of the state. So, and that took a while to arrange. 
but it happened in October 1921 when he got the first approval of a loan from the United States that any Australian government got. It became a precedent for the future, so he bypassed the London banks. It gave Queensland enough finance to survive. It meant the end of a major steel and steel works in Bowen, but the, country, the state would survive financially in the short to medium term. Secondly, there were concerns about the, the, a potential split in the Labor Party over communism and socialism. The third reason was that there was a potential split within the party itself. There was, they only had one majority member left in the, in the uh, lower house. And if Theodore had lost government, he would have ended up with power in the upper house, but, but how would that work? And fourthly, there were 27 Labor people appointed to this chamber on condition, informally, that they vote themselves out of existence. They got no pay, no benefits. They're expected to turn up to every sitting of the Legislative Council to ensure the government won the day. They had to go to caucus meetings of the Labor Party but had no right to vote in those meetings and had to comply with the decisions of caucus. So all those things came together and the final thing was that his legal research advisers had said, yes, the UK government will give consent to this bill. So it all came together perfectly in October 1921 um, and the, the bill was passed through both houses in, in about three days with only 10 members of the original House, in terms of Conservative members, voting against the bill. It was given royal assent in London. There was tremendous pressure on, on the London, um, Lon the colonial secretary in London, um, but he looked at the situation and said, this is a matter for Queensland. This is not for us to be involved, to interfere. His name was Winston Churchill. And then, so the King, gave royal assent to the bill on the 3rd of March, 1922, which is a few, two weeks ago, uh, and it took effect only upon the proclamation of the governor here on the 23rd of March, which was in four days' time. Uh, and that was due to a, a provision in an 1840 statute that required the proclamation. So I'm sorry I've gone over time, um, but I think I indicated this was a case of political assassination turned p political euthanasia. Uh, and I think the sad part of this story is that no one ever sat down and had an in-depth discussion about the pros and cons of an upper house. Uh, both sides wouldn't talk to each other. They were determined to exercise their full political power and Labor won. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jared. I'm sorry we ran out of time. Just um, before we go on to our final speaker, I want to mention just outside here we have a location called Speaker's Corner. And usually we have protests during sitting days, but we have the one man and a boombox downstairs today. So if you hear any noise coming in through the window, that's what that is. Our final speaker today is Mr Neil Laurie. Neil is the Clerk of the Parliament and the CEO of the Queensland Parliamentary Service. So would you please join me in welcoming Neil. His address is titled Life After. Protesters are getting rather clever these days. They were protesting on Monday and somebody recorded their protest and then he turned up about two hours before anyone else with a large boombox and replayed the tape. <laughs> so we all thought there was hundreds of people out there but it was one man in a boombox. <laughs> Honourable guests, I'm very pleased presenting here at this conference marking 100 years since the demise of the Legislative Council. As Clerk of Parliament, in presenting today, I must uh, step a very fine line between maintaining a non-partisan position, maintaining faith in the institution of Parliament, whilst at the same, same time discharging a duty to truth and academic debate. I hope that I've been able to maintain that line. Here we go. Now, the Queensland Parliament was established in 1859, first sitting in 1860, and was very much based in the main upon the Westminster system of government. That is, the system of government the United Kingdom had when it regularly met at Westminster Palace in London. Now, the, the hallmarks of the Westminster system of government are discernible, although they've been adapted throughout the world. But it can be said with certainty, or a degree of certainty, 
that they include the following. The Crown, or a head of state, with what uh, was once termed dignified or symbolic power, must appoint ministers who had the support and popularity of the popularly elected lower house, cabinet government, or efficient government, sometimes called. Ministers are members of either House of Parliament. Ministers are responsible to Parliament, that is, that they're accountable to Parliament. The government must be able to maintain the support of the lower house of Parliament, and a government is dismissed or must resign by being unable to secure supply, rejecting a budget, the lower house passing a no-confidence motion or defeating a confidence motion, and the Westminster system enables a government to be defeated or forced into a general election. The existence of an official opposition, otherwise known as a government in waiting, the financial initiative resting with the government, raising and spending tax, and other conventions, practices and precedents that continue to play a significant role. I think it's very important to highlight some structural differences between the Westminster system and the United Kingdom as, to, as opposed to other Commonwealth countries. They include size. The UK Parliament is very large, currently with 650 members in the lower house. Even in the late 18th century, there were over 300 members. This is a very large number of members compared to later colonial parliaments, and it is extremely difficult to maintain party discipline in such a large House of Parliament. Discipline. Discipline exists in the UK Parliament, but it is not as strong or restricted as in Canada, Parliament and New Zealand. Heritage. Parliament developed over a period of a thousand years in, in England. It is my belief that the roots of the English Parliament actually lay in the Saxon Witten. A thousand years of foreign wars, civil wars, civil strife, slowly evolving wider representation gives those in the UK Parliament a much greater appreciation of the history of the institution. Now, constitutional theorists never asserted bicameralism was a necessary part, component of responsible government and Bagot once went to so far as to express the view that with a perfect lower house, it is certain that an upper house would scarcely be of any value. Whilst unique among the states of Australia, Queensland is not the only unicameral parliament to adopt responsible government or adapt it to unicameralism. Unicameralism being the norm in the provincial level in Canada, for example. Whilst there can always be criticisms at the margin, the Queensland parliament does provide a forum for debate and grievance, and with caveats, as I will discuss below, performs as well as any other parliament in the lawmaking and financial role. Even when the numbers have been finally balanced, it's provided stable government since 1922. However, a Westminster style of parliament contains an inherent paradox. One function is to scrutinise the government. But governments are formed because they have the support of the lower house and in small parliaments with government majorities and strict party discipline, it is difficult to ensure scrutiny by the lower house. In bicameral parliaments, this function can be undertaken by an upper house. But in unicameral parliaments, scrutiny is problematic. Furthermore, the size and voting systems can mean that such parliaments are not truly representative. The Queensland parliament is less representative than many of its peers. More importantly, there are serious structural and cultural impediments that prevent the Queensland Parliament from keeping Parliament government accountable. Why do we need to keep government accountable? Well, governments exercise incredible power, both through their ability to pass legislation, but also in the decisions that they make from day to day. Anyone who's lived in this state for the last three years will see the enormous power the government has, in, has made in terms of people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm not criticising those decisions. I'm simply saying that governments wield power by their decisions and by their legislation. I do not fall into the category of those that believe that there are white hats and black hats in government. I think most members of parliament and most parties are the white hats. Sometimes when they move to the Treasury benches, they get a little beige. <laughs> it's my thesis that there's a strong relationship between constitutional structure and political culture. It's a continuation of this thesis that a constitutional realisation 
and three constitutional structural changes influenced Queensland's political culture in the 20th century and continues to do so. The realisation came with the decision in Macaulay and the King. That decision held that a state's constitutional limits, a state's constitution limits its parliament's legislative power only if derived from entrenched provisions. Put another way, parliament is a master of its old household, except so insofar as its powers have in special cases, cases been restricted, i.e. entrenched. The implications of this decision was that the entrenched constitution, a non-entrenched constitution, such as Queensland, was able to be changed, including the abolishment of the Legislative Council. But the decision had implications beyond its own facts. For example, it was later held that in dealing with public monies or any other subject not governed by special methods of lawmaking, Parliament is not bound to adhere to the letter or spirit of the provision, but it is, on the contrary, empowered to make the provision that fits fit, thinks fit whether consistent or not. Pivotal structural changes. Two of the three pivotal structural changes occurred before Macaulay and the King in Queensland. The, the Electoral Districts Act 1910 abolished multi-member seats and divided Queensland into 72 electorates with one vote, one value with a 20% tolerance. Why was this a pivotal change? Well, it culturally entrenched one member per constituency. Governments are much more likely to achieve a majority in a house with such a voting system, electoral system. This one is much more likely to be maintained in such a voting system because members are not competing for the vote with other members of the same party. Cases in point are the ACT Legislative Assembly and the Tasmanian Legislative Assembly based upon the hare clark system, where government majorities are much harder to make and keep and competition between members of the same party in the same seat can be intense or in New Zealand, which has a mixed proportional representation and, and representative vote. The second pivotal matter was the Elections Act 1914, which introduced compulsory registration and voting for persons entitled to be enrolled. Why was this a pivotal, pivotal change? No longer did candidates for elections and their party have to get out the vote. Attendance by voters was virtually assured. The third pivotal change was the abolishment of the Legislative Council, making Queensland the only state in Australia with a unicameral legislature. This paved the way for Westminster, Queensland style. The abolition of the Legislative Council of Queensland on 23rd March 1922 left Queensland with a single House of Parliament, the Legislative Assembly with single member constituencies and compulsory voting. So what was the political culture? Legalism is an ancient Chinese philosophical belief that human beings are more inclined to do wrong than right because they are motivated entirely by self-interest and require strict laws to control their impulses. But what if there are no strict laws? In Queensland, the political culture that developed post-1922 was to often take actions and pass laws that were legal but otherwise ethically or morally questionable. Do the legal thing, not necessarily the right thing. I'm going to demonstrate by 10 examples in the last century. Example one, manipulation of the electoral system. Governments in Queensland have manipulated the electoral system to the benefit of the government. The electrical, elect, Electoral Districts Act of 1931 reduced the number of electorates from 72 to 62. In 1949, the Hanlon government introduced the first gerrymander in Queensland. The gerrymander was achieved through a zonal electoral system whereby electorates were allocated into geographic zones with different quotas. This effectively benefited the government at the time because the Labor vote was mainly in the provincial, on the outskirts of provincial regional towns. However, this gerrymander would come back to bite the LAP, ALP as changing demographics meant it began to benefit the National Party. The National Party embraced the system. In 1958, the gerrymander was continued by the, LM, by the uh, National Party Liberal Party Nicklin government with 78 electorates established across the three zones. In 1971, the National Party, Liberal Party under Bajoke Peterson ensured legislation continuing the gerrymander again with 82 electorates established in four zones. In 
with remarkable differences in numbers in each, each zone. The lower numbers, obviously, benefiting the government. In 1985, the Liberal Party National Party by Jock Peterson government ensured legislate, sorry, the National Party government, no Liberals at that time, uh, ensured legislation continuing the gerrymander with 89 electorates established in four zones. Now, following the Queensland of the Fitzgerald inquiry, the election of the Goss government and the establishment of the Electoral Administrative Review Committee in 1991, 89 electorates were established in accordance with EARC's recommendations. Electoral zones were abolished, optional preferential voting was introduced, and a system of weighting large sized electorates was introduced. To date, EARC's electoral system has not been altered, although, as explained below, the voting system was altered in 2016. It will be interesting to see how long the temptation to tamper with the electoral system can be resistant. Despite the endurance of the electoral model from 1983 to, through to 2006, the number of electorates in the state did not increase. Smaller parliaments benefit government. Example two, the voting system. Governments in Queensland have manipulated the voting system to benefit the government. We have, and I won't go through them in great detail, from 1860 to 1892, first past the post. Then we had the introduction of preferential voting uh, known as the contingent vote, largely introduced by conservative governments to counter the Labor Party's large vote and ensure smaller parties went, uh, the party votes went back to the conservatives. The Elections Act 1942 reintroduced first past the post voting. The Elections Act 1962 introduced compulsory preferential voting. As previously mentioned, as a result of EARC, the EARC review, optional preferential voting was introduced into e uh, via e EARC's electoral system and la lasted until late one night in 2016. In 2016, an electoral redistribution was due for the 46th Parliament. As a result, in the 45th Parliament, there were a number of attempts to address the size of the House, as it was clear that without increasing the numbers of members in the House, the fast-growing South East Queensland would gain more seats at the expense of regional and rural areas. There were three bills, I won't go into them in detail, they'll be in the paper, but there were three bills introduced, the first two were defeated. The third bill was eventually, would eventually pass its second reading. And in consideration and detail, the Labor Party and the Cata Party introduced another amendment to the, an amendment to the bill which took away optional preferential voting and in, introduced compulsory preferential voting. Now, it's no doubt that the Cata Party saw great electoral advantage in compulsory preferential voting and probably hoped it would bring about a split in the LNP because the optional preferential voting system had largely led to the formation of the LNP. The fact that the ALP won the 2017 election with an additional four seats despite a swing against it on the primary vote of about 2% and to it about, of about 2.2% in the two party preferred vote is probably evidence that the voting system change improved its overall position. Of course, compulsory preferential voting is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it can help and sometimes it can be devastating. Example three, parliamentary reform invariably favours government control, committees generally. From 1860 to 1922, there was extensive use of select committees in the Queensland Parliament. Committees considered legislative proposals and in a on a vast array of issues affecting all parts of the state. The committee system in Queensland went into decline almost immediately from 1922, although it had been in decline in the Legislative Assembly probably from about 1915. From 1922 to 1989, there was only a handful of select committees, apart from domestic committees, such as the Library Committee and the Members' Refreshment Room Committee. <laughs> Very important committee. There was not a single select committee between 1915 and 1974. A subordinate legislation committee was established in 1975 and continued in successive parliaments, and there was a select committee on education during 1978 and 1979 where Michael Hearn actually made his name. In 
It was not until the late 1980s, during the Fitzgerald inquiry and the Hearn government, that Queensland saw the first slow steps towards the current committee system. Legislation was enacted in 1988 to establish the Parliamentary Committee of Public Accounts and Public Works was established the following year. Other committees were subsequently established by legislation or appointed by resolution as the House for oversight or to scrutinise various aspects of government policy and administration. The Fitzgerald report in 1989, when it came down, said clearly, there is a need to consider introducing a comprehensive system of parliamentary committees to enhance the ability of parliament to monitor the efficiency of government. The Goss government, elected in 1989, should be congratulated for its efforts in implementing most Fitzgerald and EARC recommendations. The legislative books from 1990 into 1995 form the genesis for much of the integrity and accountability frameworks that we have today. Freedom of information, now right to information, judicial review of administrative decisions, electoral laws, freedom of protest, <laughs> are all rooted in this era. In addition, there were significant policy changes in public administration. However, when it came to parliamentary reform, the response was much more lukewarm. The committee system established in the 1990s was not really fit for purpose and not in keeping with either the Fitzgerald report or EARC recommendations. As will be discussed later, neither was the estimates process or the legislative process. I might also add a recommendation by EARC that opposition resources be 20% of ministerial resources has never been adopted and has always hovered at about half of that amount. A unicameral parliament should have a committee system that encompasses and scrutinise, scrutinises the array of functions of government. Until 2012, there were no committees with responsibility for areas of government such as health, economics and education, despite recommendations for such committees from royal commissions. Until 2012, the work of the committees and the work of the Legislative Assembly were largely separate and distinct as opposed to being complementary. Now, reforms from 2009 to 2011 resulted in the portfolio system which has given Queensland Parliament a much more comprehensive parliamentary committee system and one that covers the field of government. It is relevant to the workings of the Assembly and, in theory, should create oversight and scrutiny needed. I fear that the oversight and scrutiny functions have been hampered by a few things, such as the distraction of policy inquiries and confidentiality requirements, but that's a whole paper in itself. Example four, parliamentary reform invariably favours government control legislation. The lukewarm approach to parliamentary reform in the 90s is no better demonstrated than by the legislative process in place until 2012. The Queensland Parliament's legislative process, uh, the system, was an antiquated relic, little changed since 1860. Where bills could be introduced and then debated, amended and passed in seven days, without being declared urgent until 20, 2002, where it was made 14 days, a huge reform. Bills were in months or years of development departments were only available for members, stakeholders and the public for days before they became law. There was no committee review of legislation, no formal process or stakeholder engagement and consultation with parliament and extremely little time to effectively scrutinise policy or content. Or content. The cartoon being shown ridicules the short time frames and the bulk of legislation in the Bajoka Peterson government, but that process largely continued until 2012, under governments of all colours. Our, our legislative process has failed the benchmarks developed by interparliamentary institutions aimed at developing nations. In particular, the absence of committee scrutiny of legislation was a serious impediment to parliament. I'm extremely pleased to say that our legislative system since 2012 is much improved. It's not perfect, but members, stakeholders and the public generally are, are served well by our, by our portfolio committees and their legislative scrutiny. Example five, parliamentary reform invariably favours government control, the supine estimates committee process. The Estimates Committee system recommended by EARC and introduced in 1996 also, introduced, also demonstrates a lukewarm approach to parliamentary reform. The Queensland Estimates process, first introduced in 1996, was tightly controlled with restrictive and structured timeframes for questions and answers. 
Borrowed from the Legislative Assembly of New South Wales, it bore no resemblance to the committee system operating in upper houses such as the Senate. The Committee System Review Committee recommended a freer flowing system in, 20, in its 2010 report. Although changes occurred in the standing orders and the rules, the culture did not change. And now chairs and committees implement essentially the same processes that existed before 2010. Example six. Estimates processes can be truncated. From its introduction in 1996 until 2011, the budget had been considered by seven estimates committees established each year by motion. From 2011, the seven portfolios committees had, to be con had considered the budget, a committee hearing each day for seven days over two weeks. On the 2nd of April 2014, the then Newman government had truncated the hearing dates for the seven estimates committees, ensuring all seven estimates committees con conducted their hearings over a two-day period. The fairly obvious motive for this change, although not stated, was to both ensure a very small opposition was overstretched and to limit media coverage to a two-day period rather than two weeks. Ironically, the move also resulted in each committee spending more time in hearings. Estimates Committee returned to its normal seven days of hearings in 2015. However, more recently, the motions sending the estimates to portfolio committees have set out in greater detail their times of sitting and the program of inquiry, thus limiting the discretion of committees to determine their own schedule. The government, through these motions, control the process, not the committees. Example seven. Processes can be set aside and wrongdoing forgiven. Parliament was recalled during the traditional Christmas break on 9 December 2005 to respond to a report of the crime and the then Crime and Corruption Committee, Commission, sorry. The report revealed that an investigation had found sufficient evidence to charge a minister of deliberately misleading the estimates committee. However, the conduct was also a contempt. The House was recalled, the minister apologised and a motion was moved to find the minister of contempt, but find his apology and resignation from the ministry sufficient penalty. This effectively barred further criminal prosecution. The recall of Parliament to deal with a matter arising from a CC, CMC investigation and report as an example how dealing with, a, uh, with an ethical issue can easily become hopelessly partisan if normal procedure is not followed. The matter was already before the members of an ethics committee. That committee had established a long history of dealing with difficult matters in an appropriate and bipartisan fashion. In its history to that time, there had only ever been one dissenting report. Even if the committee had not been able to come to a bipartisan conclusion and agreed action, proper process would have been followed if the committee had been allowed to proceed in the normal way. Ironically, the same minister would later be convicted of corruption and appear, in the bar, appear at the bar of the House charged with contempt for failing to declare gifts from a mining, from a mining magnet. Committee eight, committees can be sacked. In late 2013, a controversy arose, arose around the acting chairperson of the Crime and Corruption Commission the matter started with an article that was written by the acting chairperson about crime, a government crime legislation, a very boring little article. It led to an allegation that the acting chairperson had met with the government media operative before submitting the article, and a serious allegation that the acting chairperson had misled the PCC, its oversight committee. An interesting aside to this was that the chair was a well-respected independent member of the, of the assembly. However, the government then moved a motion without, no without notice to have the Attorney-General briefed on the matter and the Chair tabled on behalf of the committee transcripts of a hearing about the matter. The following day was a day of high drama. In an unrelated matter, a member of the House that resigned the day before was called to the Bar of the House and dealt with the contempt for failing to declare matters on his register and fined $2,000 for each 42 instances of failing to declare. Later that evening, at 9 p.m., a motion was moved to establish a select committee of ethics and send the matters relating to the acting chair of the C to that committee. No difficulty. But the motion also sacked all members of the PCCC. It should be noted that there has been other instances of individuals being removed from committees by the government. Sometimes this has been due to their own conduct, other times simply because of shifting political allegiances. But in this instance, there can be no sensible argument that the, sac that the committee was doing other than that for which it was established. 
Example nine. The spirit of the Constitution can be breached if not broken. One of the consequences of moving to fixed four-year terms in 2016 were recommendations that the Queensland Constitution be amended to at least recognise the role of parliamentary committees and the role of estimates processes. Section 26B of the Constitution of Queensland 2001 was inserted in 2016. The uh, now, the relatively new Section 23 provided that the Assembly must ensure that each bill is referred to a portfolio committee or another committee for examination by the committee and provides a timetable for referral must be at least six weeks. So the provision essentially assures that legislation goes to committee for consideration. This section also clarifies that it does not prevent the Legislative Assembly by ordinary majority from declaring a bill urgent under the standing rules and sending it to committee for an urgent purpose. Now, it would be assumed that urgent legislation would follow the process in the section. However, governments don't like to leave a record of urgent legislation, so they've devised other methods to circumvent the constitutional provisions. One way is to effectively introduce new bills as amendments to existing bills. For example, during the second reading of the Community Services Industry Portable Long Service Bill on 16 June 2020, after the bill had already been considered by the Education, Employment and Small Business Committee, the relevant minister circulated 51 pages of amendments. The amendments were actually irrelevant to the bill and dealt with matters such as changing a public holiday date, deferring public service wage increases and minor matters relating to COVID-19. In another example, the Electoral and Other Legislation Accountability, Integrity and Other Matters Amendment Bill 2019 I'll read that title again. Electoral and Other Legislation, Accountability, Integrity and Other Matters, Amendment Bill 2019. The relevant minister circulated 100 pages containing 229 amendments to this bill prior to the second reading debate, after it had been considered by the Economics and Government Committees. The amendments were circulated by the clerk, me, at nine, nine o'clock on the minister's instructions the evening prior to the commencement of the second reading debate at 2.42 the next day. Both bills were subject to section 26 prior to the substantive amendments being moved and were not considered urgent. Now the opposition complained to the speaker about this increasing trend to remove, to move substantial unrelated amendments to bills already considered or reported on by committees. The opposition noted the increasing trend by governments to do this. Now Mr. Speaker um, ruled that he was unable to rule the practice unlawful. Advice obtained by the Speaker from Mr Del, Avia, Del Villiar QC confirmed that although moving substantial amendments after a bill had already been scrutinised by a committee and might be regarded as contrary to the spirit of the Constitution, the practice itself did not breach Section 26B. Example 10. The purpose of the Constitution can be avoided by characterisation. Also introduced in 2016, section 26 of the Constitution Act provides that the Legislative Assembly must ensure each bill for the annual appropriation is referred to the Portfolio Committee for examination, the estimates process. On 22 April 2020, the appropriation COVID bill was introduced, debated and passed on the same day. The bill appropriated $1,614,000,000 from the Consolidated Fund for Departments of the financial year. This was not an annual appropriation. This amount was, however, in addition... Well, sorry, I'll go back a bit. This amount was in addition to the amount of $27,000,000 already authorised by a previous Appropriation Act. More significantly, on 8 September 2020, the Treasurer introduced the Appropriation Bill 2020 and the Appropriation Parliament Bill. The bills were declared urgent and were set to pass the House by close of business on 10th September, i.e. introduced Tuesday, passed on Thursday. The long title of the Appropriation Bill was a bill for an act authorising the Treasurer to pay amounts from the Consolidated Fund for Departments of the Financial Year starting 1 July and 1 July 2019 to 2020. Clause 3 of the bill provided the Treasurer was authorised to pay $28 billion in some sense from the Consolidated Fund for Departments for the Financial Year. Are we confused? The net effect of all this 
was that by passing this bill, we would have around about $54 billion worth of expenditure approved for the year. Now, the, the effect of having it declared urgent to pass on the Thursday meant that there was not going to be any estimates process on this bill. Um, now, the member for Clayfield, a former treasurer, rose on a point of privilege and raised an issue about the constitutionality of those bills not being sent to estimates by, uh, uh, for examination. The Speaker ruled later that day. The Speaker said, and there was explanations given by the, the Treasurer in here, and effectively it was that the, he had advice from the Solicitor General that because the appropriation bills were not the full amount for the full financial year, that there was no need for them to go to estimates. That is, that they weren't the annual appropriation bill as defined. The Speaker ruled later that day that it appeared that the pivotal issue was whether the bills introduced by the Treasurer are annual appropriation bills. The Speaker noted that the Treasurer had indicated that he had legal advice that the appropriation bills were not annual appropriation as it does not seek an amount from the consolidated for the full financial year. And the Treasurer further indicated that through the level of interim supply sought, it was not represent the current estimates of the total appropriation necessary. Now, the Speaker relied on advice from the Attorney-General and the Treasurer in this regard and could not rule that there was any breach of the Constitution. And the Speaker also ruled that the section 26 of the Constitution of the Queensland Act is probably not a manner and form provision, but it's rather a provision dealing with the internal parliamentary procedure and is, is hence not non judiciable is hence non judiciable Speaker noted that it not mean that it should be ignored by the House, the duty has a duty to follow procedure in law, but it means that legislation passed is unlikely to be challenged. Now, estimates had been truncated in 2015 by the Newman government and simply postponed in the 2020 year until after the election. After the election, the appropriation 2020-21 bill was introduced. And it, it, th this bill was characterised as a state budget, authorising the Treasurer to pay $60 billion from the Consolidated Fund for Departments of the Financial Year. However, the explanatory notes makes it clear that the amount includes amounts already authorised under the Appropriation Act, the Appropriation COVID Act and the Appropriation Bill. In other words, the official budget in 2020 was for about $3.3 billion. One cannot but think that the culture evident in the abolition of the council re-emerges from time to time in Queensland. It's a numbers game, winner taking all. No need for compromise, no conviction that people other than those in government can positively contribute, for example, to review or amend legislation. My observations of other parliaments with bicameral parliaments suggest that there is, by virtue of necessity, more of a culture of compromise than exists in Queensland, more tolerance of other views, no matter who sits on the Treasury benches. But the same culture of compromise can also be said of other unicameral parliaments, both in Australia and abroad, such as New Zealand and Canada, but those in other unicameral parliaments are more likely to have no row of government majorities or no government majority at all. Their electoral systems do not permit massive and usually long-term government majorities. Thank you. I'd now like to call on the Vice President of the RHSQ, Michael Halliday, to give the vote of thanks and to present a small gift to each speaker. Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful, informative and entertaining seminar. It gives me very great pleasure to move the vote of thanks to all involved in this most successful joint venture between the Queensland Parliament and the Royal Historical Society of Queensland, who have worked together with a common object of preserving relevant aspects of Queensland history. And it is hoped and anticipated that such a relationship will continue well into the future. In particular, I wish to thank the Governor of Queensland, Her Excellency, the Honourable Dr Jeanette Young, PSM, the patron of our society, for her attendance 
and her address. I wish to thank the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. I note that he's not here at the moment, but I thank him, the Honourable, Kurt, um, Honourable Curtis Pitt, for, for the permission to hold the event and for it to take place in this marvellous Red Chamber. I wish to thank the Clerk of the Parliament, Mr Neil Laurie, for his promotion of Queensland history. A successful seminar such as this cannot occur without competent, expert speakers. And I thank each of them today for their attendance. I thank them for their presentations which not only showed their deep and thorough knowledge of the subject upon which they spoke, but, but which also evidenced the fruits of their research, which has resulted in a most interesting, informative and helpful exercise for all, for all of us to better understand an, a, a most important aspect and incident of Queensland history. Thank you so very much for sharing your time and knowledge with us and permitting us a better understanding of the history of this parliament. I'm sure that you will all agree that a successful seminar such as this cannot be achieved without appropriate and thorough organisation. Accordingly, I thank and uh, express appreciation and congratulations to all those involved in the organisation of this event, including the Parliamentary Library for research assistance and the event organisation, all the volunteers and all those behind the scenes who have participated to make this such a great event. And I also thank, finally but not last, uh, lastly but not finally, the Parliamentary Librarian and her administrative skills is acting as our MC today. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> All papers um, at this seminar will be published in a special edition of the Queensland History Journal of the Society and also on its website later in the year. Now, I've got a captive audience and since I have that, might I invite you, before you leave, to pick up on the seats an application form to join our marvellous society. It looks like this. It's a colour brochure. It should be on the, on, the ta on the seats. If not, here's a copy and I'll give it to the first person. Uh, or you can consult the, uh, the website. Thank you very much.